But the Sabbath offered freedom, an entire day to pursue God and to step back from life, to take a breath, to reflect. Much like an artist who stands back from a painting to see the whole picture, God gave the Sabbath so that, so that his people could step back and consider the bigger picture of life. Now, just imagine what this command must have meant for the Israelites who had just been freed from a life of slavery. For generations, they had toiled under the whips of the Egyptians, and, and, and there were no days off from that. But now God comes along, and he commands, you will have a day of rest. And you know what I think? I think God knows his creation. He knows that he designed us to have regular, consistent days of rest. But some think they know better. A few years ago, I met a man who had been uh, the administrator of a large church back in the 1980s, and he shared with me how the senior minister of that church refused to take a day off. He just never would. And even worse, he wouldn't let his staff have a day off. And he died in his early 50s of a, of a stress-induced heart attack. It's been suggested that we'll either honor the fourth commandment now or suffer while lying in a hospital bed, psychiatric ward, or maybe even an early grave. I read this week about a man whose type A personality father died in his early 40s. At the graveside, his mother mumbled, your dad was like a top. He spun and spun until he was done. We are God's creation. And he knows what's best. And rest is best. Wayne Moeller is an author of a book called Sabbath, Finding Rest, Renewal, and Delight in Our Busy Lives. And he makes a strong case for rest. He writes that for everything, there is the necessity of dormancy, the deep rhythm of work and rest. And when we're traveling at a high speed, there is a subtle sense of undernourishment because even even the good things we're doing don't have time to sink in we've gotten to the point where the only culturally accepted reason to stop entirely is when we get sick and that's a terrible thing simply because we've forgotten this principle of a sabbath rest now in addition to rest the sabbath was for worship it was a holy day. But I think, you know, some people say that they keep the Sabbath um, and they spend the day just being entertained and being kind of lazy. You know, watch pizza or watch football, eat pizza rolls all day. And I'm not saying that you can't do those things on the Sabbath, but there is a big difference between restfulness and laziness. The heart behind the Sabbath command was not just to take a day off, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. So when we rest, it should be a day dedicated to the Lord your God. You know, it's not just a time to binge on Disney+. Plus. Now another Old Testament instruction for the Sabbath is found in Exodus chapter 16, verse 29, which says, On the Sabbath day... You must each stay in your place. Some translations put it this way. You should stay home. Now, if you're married to a workaholic, imagine. Imagine how good it would be for your marriage and for your family if your workaholic took an entire day off every week and focused on God and your family. Do you think, do you think that would make a difference in your marriage? Do you think that might benefit your kids? I do. 
Many of you will recognize the name Dr. Laura Schlesinger as a radio personality who is an advocate for the family. She's also a defender of the Sabbath because it provides large quantities of family time. You see, she rejects this modern idea that it's really only about quality, not quantity. You've probably heard that. It's all about quality, not quantity. She points out that the problem with that thinking is that quality time can't really be scheduled. It, it, usually, it usually doesn't happen when we want it to. Isn't that true? I mean, have you ever planned and saved and shopped and decorated and baked and wrapped the presents all so that Christmas Day would be this magical quality time, but then the kids, all they want to do is fight and complain over who got more? My parents have. Quality time can't be planned. God wanted his people to have quality time and a quantity of time. Now, just like a lot of ideas um, that God gave to us, his commands, once people got involved in them, they, they really kind of messed them up. And the Sabbath day was messed up by people. Because eventually, the Jews who were on the legalistic side got involved in the Sabbath, and they started adding all of these different rules to the Sabbath. In fact, they had more than 1,500 ways that a person could violate the fourth commandment. And these were man-made rules, violations. And they included things like, you couldn't tie a knot on the Sabbath. That's ridiculous. You couldn't untie a knot on the Sabbath. You couldn't start a fire. You couldn't even kill a mosquito on the Sabbath. That was a violation. It wasn't permitted. And so what was meant to be a gift from God really became a burden. But then Jesus came along and he often confronted, confronted the Pharisees or these legalistic Jews. Mark chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 describe how Jesus healed a man's shriveled hand on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees accused him of working on the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? So Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. I bet they did. And then in Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, it says that one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to them, or said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They weren't even allowed to pick heads of grain. And Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In that sentence, that sentence, I think, is really the key to understanding the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for man. So the Sabbath was intended to, to ease people's burdens. It was not intended to burden anybody. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the, but the substance is Christ. Now, some of you will remember the name Wayne Smith. Remember Wayne? He spoke here several years ago for, uh, for a revival, and he has since passed away. Well, at the time, 
he was pastoring a church in Lexington, Kentucky, and he told the story about the time his mother came to visit him. And he said, my mother was a legalist. She was very strict. And on the way home from church on Sunday night, he said, I stopped at Baskin Robbins to go and get some ice cream. I started to get out of the car, and my mother from the back seat said, Wayne, since when did we start buying ice cream on the Lord's Day? And Wayne said, we don't, Mother. Got back in the car and drove her home. He said after she went to bed, he got back in the car and went back to Baskin Robbins. <laughs> And he said, God is full of grace, but my mother isn't. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, don't let anyone judge you with how you observe the Sabbath. You're free from the law. And at the same time, let's remember the words of Jesus. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for man, for you and for me. And we should think of it as a gift it's something that we should let benefit us. And I don't know about you, but when I look around at our overloaded world, our stressful schedules, I think we all need a weekly day of rest. Amen. Don't you? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Father, again, um, just like every week, we confess that we've all broken your commandments, including this one, we've fallen short, and so we're grateful, Lord, that you sent your Son to die for our shortcomings, for our sins. We are thankful for the gift of eternal life, which comes only by trusting and receiving your Son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'll see. 